thanks everybody. Thanks very much to Professor Gordon, to, to Ash, to Cam, to um, Evan, all the others who worked so hard to arrange this. I'm honored to be here. Um, this is a fabulous idea. Um, Band Books Week, uh, I pay attention to every year. Um, here's a note. Um, librarians are my heroes. They should be your heroes. Um, go find a librarian and ask if they want a hug. Don't just run up and hug a librarian. <laughs> That would be wrong, but us, because they fight for things we all believe in, including free speech, including anonymity, privacy, and access to knowledge where the warrant is, I have a pulse, not I have a lot of money, right? So librarians, yay. Um, but books are banned by more entities than school boards and the others who control access to libraries. Books are also banned by legislatures. They're also banned by courts, and that's going to be the book that I'm going to read to you. Um, it is a book written by an African-American novelist, Alice Randall. Ms. Randall grew up uh, fascinated with the world of Gone with the Wind and gradually started noticing that there was a curious omission in Gone with the Wind, African Americans, slaves. Or if they were there, they were merely um, there as uh, stereotypes, uh, figures that, that, barely, that barely registered. Um, so what I want to do is read um, what she did. She decided she would write the story of Gone with the Wind again, but she would write it from the slave's perspective. She called it The Wind Done Gone. In the story, the main character, Sainara, is, is a slave. Her half-sister, Other, is Scarlet, is basically an uninteresting character. Um, her lover, R, Rhett, an obviously gay Ashley Wilkes, um, appears, A. Um, and all of the white characters are flat, one-dimensional, just like the African-American characters were in Gone with the Wind. And slavery is not romanticized, unlike in Gone with the Wind. A federal district court judge decided this was copyright infringement. You can't tell this story, this story that is owned by the Mitchell estate, Margaret Mitchell, the, it's Gone with the Wind, still under copyright. Um, and this was a violation of this, um, the Mitchell estate's property rights. They said, the judge, the district court judge said, I, the way I see it, your client just took a bulldozer and drove it through the walls of Tara and drove all over that landscape. And I can, enjoy, I can enjoin a bulldozer, can't I? To which the lawyers for Ms. Randall said, our bulldozer is protected by the First Amendment. It took to getting to the appeals court for him to believe that. One of the lawyers on that case was a Duke grad who had studied uh, Duke Law School and had also studied um, literature at Duke. Her name's Jennifer Jenkins. You should go ask her about the case. She has some good stories to tell. I'm her husband, but I'm the one talking, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> so here um, is what that judge, for some weeks, managed to enjoin. The wind done gone, Alice Randall. Today is the anniversary of my birth. I have 28 years. This diary and the pen I am writing with are the best gifts I got, except maybe my cake. R gave me the diary, the pen, and the white frosted tears. He also gave me emerald earbobs. I think maybe my emeralds are just green glass. I hope maybe they might be genuine. I was born May 25th, 1845, at half past seven in the morning, into slavery. On a cotton farm a day's ride from Atlanta, my father, planter, was the master of the place. My mother was the mammy. My half-sister, other, was the belle of five counties. She was not beautiful. But men seldom recognized this, caught up in the cloud of commotion and scent in which she moved. R certainly didn't. He married her. But then again, he left her. Maybe that means something to me. Maybe he's the unseldom one who do recognize. If I strip the flesh off my bones like they stripped the clothes off my flesh in the slave market down near the Battery in Charleston, this would be my skeleton. Childhood on a cotton farm? A time of shawl fetch slavery in Charleston? A bare-breasted hour on an auction block? Drudge slavery as a maid in beauty's Atlanta brothel? And a season of candle flame concubinage in the attic of a body house, a watery grand tour of Europe, and finally concubinage in my own white clapboard home with green shutters and gas lights. How many miles have I traveled to come back to here? Mammy was my mama. Even though she let me go, I miss her. I miss her every time I look into a mirror and see her eyes. Sometimes I comb through my long springy curls and pretend that the hand holding the comb is hers. But I don't know what that looks like. 
Then I wish I was other, the girl whose sausage curls I've seen Mammy comb and comb and comb. I wish for the tight kinks of the comber or the glossy sausages of the combed. I wish not to be out of the picture. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ash and Cam and Evan and others for organizing this, um, <clears throat> and all of you for coming. So I um, picked two classic works uh, whose banning is central both to the development of the First Amendment and to their history. <clears throat> James Joyce's Ulysses, a classic of modern literature, turns out to be so involved in its own history with its banning and then the lifting of the ban that I realized earlier this week when I opened up my old copy of it that this copy from the 50s actually opens with a um, complete transcript of the 1933 decision by Judge John Woolsey lifting the ban on the admission of Ulysses into the US. <clears throat> Um, the, other, the other book is the Communist Manifesto, which was entered into evidence in the 1951 case of U.S. v. Dennis, holding that members of the Communist Party could be um, criminally punished in the United States for abstract advocacy of the doctrines of Marxism, um, a pivotal case in the development of First Amendment protection for political speech in this country. Uh, I, contrary to what you might think, I don't actually have a handsome bound copy of the Communist Manifesto, so I, I only brought this. Um, but I found it online. You can get it here, maybe not in China or North Korea, but you can easily find it online in the US. Um, so they're both written with a certain intensity, a certain rush of energy, uh, momentum, which is perhaps often characteristic of books whose reasons for surviving are connected with their reasons for um, attracting uh, bands. So I ran them together in a way that I thought captured something of their respective and distinct voices. It begins with Ulysses, with the famous first lines of Ulysses. <sighs> Stately, plump, Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors and left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. The bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers. I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go out and create something, I asked him, atheists or whatever they call themselves. Go wash the cobbles off themselves. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anybody that made it all? Who? Ah, oh, they don't know. Neither do I. So there you are. They might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguish the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. The sun shines for you, he said, the day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Halth Head and the gray tweed suit and his straw hat, the day I got him to propose to me. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth. All fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new-formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. 
My God, after that long kiss, I near lost my breath. Yes, he said, I was a flower of the mountain. Yes, so we are all flowers, a woman's body. Yes, that was one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today, yeah. That was why I liked him. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. All perfume, yes, and his heart was going like mad, and I said, yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Thank you. Uh, as a member of the research faculty who also wears a librarian hat most of the time, I am especially honored to be part of this event. Uh, I'd be willing to bet you real money that the freedom to read is near and dear to the heart of every professional librarian you'll ever meet. And if you ever do find yourself talking to someone who's worked in a public library like I have or a K through 12 library, I would bet you real money that they have a story about a challenge to a book in their collection. Um, Unlike some of the titles you're going to hear today, my book selection isn't a frequently banned or even challenged book. I've chosen The Egypt Game by Zilpha Keatley Snyder. It's one of her three Newbery Honor winning books. If you don't know much about children's literature, that's basically like being an Oscar nominee for an author. Um, the Egypt Game is not a frequently banned book. As I said, I only found a reference to one single challenge a couple of years back. And I don't believe that it was successful. And that's probably worth noting that thanks to efforts of groups like the ACLU, Professor Jenkins, maybe some of you someday in the future as lawyers, uh, many of these challenges are not successful. But the fact that this book was even challenged at all, to me, really illustrates that any title can be a target of this. The Egypt Game was published in 1967, and it tells the story of a group of young friends who share an interest in the history of ancient Egypt. And they create this space where they can dress up and play act these mock Egyptian rituals in a nearby abandoned storage yard. So these Egyptian worship rituals were the reason for the challenge, by the way. Um, but after something really terrible happens that shatters the security of their neighborhood, the group needs to get creative about keeping their after school game alive um, and keeping it secret as well. So this is where my passage picks up. It's shortly after a new player has joined the game and right before that terrible thing takes place. <clears throat> the Egypt game, Zilpha Keatley Snyder. For a few days, it was fun just doing everything over for Elizabeth to appreciate. And after that, they got around to starting a new part of the game. In the new part, Marshall finally got to be the young pharaoh, Marsha Moses, again, and Elizabeth was the queen, Neferbeth. April and Melanie were priestesses. First, they were evil priestesses, leading Marsha Moses and Neferbeth into the clutches of the wicked set. And then they were priestesses of Isis coming to the rescue. That was about where they were in the game when something happened that almost put an end to the Egypt game. And not to the Egypt game alone, but to all the outdoor games in the whole neighborhood. On that particular afternoon, the girls had built a dungeon out of cardboard boxes in the corner of the storage yard. Elizabeth and Marshall were languishing in the dungeon, tied hand and foot, victims of the priests of Set. April and Melanie were creeping cautiously from pillar to pillar in the Temple of Evil on their way to the rescue. Melanie was crouching behind an imaginary pillar when suddenly she straightened up and stood listening. In the dungeon, Elizabeth heard it too and quickly untied her bonds. April ran to help Marshall with his. They were really only kite string and knotted easily. From somewhere not too far away, perhaps the main alley behind the Casa Rosada, Mrs. Ross's voice was calling, Melanie. Marshall, Melanie. There was something about the tone of her voice that made Melanie's eyes widen with fear. Something's wrong, she said. It's too early, April nodded. She never gets home this early. They scrambled through the hole in the fence and dragging Marshall to hurry him up, they dashed for the main alley behind the Casa Rosada. From there they could safely answer without giving the location of Egypt away. Thank you.
Good thing they didn't ban Green Eggs and Ham. That's the first book I ever read when I was three. I remember reading it. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Spain, and when I was there, I often read Ernest Hemingway, who spent a lot of time in Spain in Pamplona, where I am, uh, a couple weeks every year. And uh, something about reading his books there is, is, is particularly powerful. Uh, and he was very involved with the uh, Spanish Civil War, an event that I've been trying to come to grips with because it, 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 he so much wanted the United States to become involved uh, in the Civil War. England and the United States both stayed out of it. And uh, Hitler didn't. Hitler came in on the side of the fascists and uh, uh, you know, the, the rest is history. Uh, but his books are incredibly powerful, and I think For Whom the Bell Tolls is probably my favorite book that I've uh, read. I keep reading it, and I'm glad to have had a chance to look at it again. And it's on the list. It's number 30 on the list of banned books by the ALA. Hemingway's got three. He's got Farewell to Arms at number 18. It's kind of something kind of a sports event, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, the sun, uh, that sun also rises is number 18, and Farewell to Arms is number 20. This is only number 30. Uh, uh, but I think it's interesting for our purposes today. It was, uh, the, the post office said it was a book that could not be mailed. And the reason why, it's about the Spanish Civil War, published in 1940. Uh, and, but the thought was it was pro-communist. Uh, and that's true. The Republicans in the Spanish Civil War had some communists and some other folks on their side. The, the political world is much more complicated in other countries than in ours. But I think the thing that's even more interesting is it was unanimously selected by the Pulitzer Prize jurors in 1941 to win a Pulitzer Prize. But the chairman of the board, the president of Columbia University, Nicholas Murray Butler, vetoed it. He thought it was not a good book. He thought it was offensive and profane. And he said, I hope you will reconsider before you ask the university to be associated with an award for a work of this nature. And there was no fiction award winner that year for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, so different ways of banning and condemning books. The For Whom the Bell Tolls, the, the, the title comes from the poem by John Donne. I'll just read a little of it. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of a continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for him. Um, it's a book about, you know, it's a couple of days in the life of the Spanish Civil War. An American is there on the side of the Republic, becomes involved. His job is to blow up a bridge. He doesn't really know why. He's not quite sure. The people he works with, his allies, are not too sure. There's a great deal about death and individuality. So let me read some of that. This is about one of the, people, the compatriots that he's with. If he had known how many men have had to use a hill to die on, it would not have cheered him any. For in the moment he was passing through, men are not impressed by what has happened to other men in similar circumstances, any more than a widow of one day is helped by the knowledge that other loved husbands have died. Whether one has fear of it or not, one's death is difficult to accept. Soto accepted it, but there was no sweetness in his acceptance, even at 52. He joked about it to himself, but he looked at the sky and at the far mountains, and he swallowed the wine, and he did not want it. If one must die, he thought, and clearly one must, I can die, but I hate it. Dying was nothing, and he had no picture of it, nor fear of it in his mind, but living was a field of grain blowing on the wind on the side of a hill. Living was a hawk in the sky. Living was an earthen jar of water in the dust of the threshing with the grain flailed out and the chaff blowing. Living was a horse between your legs and a carbine under one leg and a hill and a valley and a stream with trees along it and the far side of the valley and the hills beyond. Sordo passed the wine bottle back and nodded his head in thanks. He leaned forward and patted the dead horse on the shoulder where the muzzle of the automatic fire had burned the hide. He could still smell the burnt hair. He thought how he had held the horse there, trembling, with fire around them, whispering and crackling, over and around them like a curtain and had carefully shot him just at the intersection of the cross lines between two eyes and ears. This is another part of the passage. There's nothing else than now. There's neither yesterday, certainly, nor is there tomorrow. How old must you be before you know that? There's only now. And if now is only two days, then two days is your life, and everything in it will be in proportion. This is how you live a life in two days. And if you stop complaining, 
and asking for what you will never get, you'll have a good life. A good life is not measured by any biblical span. Another chip part. How little we know of what there is to know. I wish that I were going to live a long time instead of going to die today, because I've learned much about life in these few days, more, I think, than in any other time. I'd like to be an old man to really know. I wonder if you keep on learning, or if there is only a certain amount each man can understand. I thought I knew so many things that I know nothing of. I wish there was more time. read my excerpt and explain why I selected it. There's a couple of reasons here. And uh, the book I have is off the Cox Library shelf, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, an Indian History of the American West uh, by D. Brown, thought to be one of the great classic works of cataloging the displacement of Native Americans over the last half of the 19th century. So what happened uh, repeated over and over and over again. So if you want to say you read this book, you can read one chapter, uh, because they all play out again and again and again. There's something like 20 different tribes that are cataloged in the book, and uh, each of them had the same kind of violent experience uh, in, in the white man's quest uh, to uh, displace Native Americans. <clears throat> and they always get uh, seduced in the process by first, there's a friendly gathering. And so that happened in, right around the beginning of the Civil War, 1861, where the Mandalusuli were encouraged to come in to this one area. And they didn't have to be near the military post, but there was a military post nearby. And there could be some trading that occurred there uh, between the Native Americans and the Blue Coats, OK? And that uh, post was uh, Fort Falteroy, OK? So here we go, 1861. After the winter meeting in which you've set up the fort, okay, there were several months of friendship between the soldiers and the Navajos. Rumors reached the Indians of a big war somewhere far to the east, a war between the white Americans of the north and the south. They learned that some of the Canby soldiers, that's the local soldiers, had exchanged their blue coats for gray coats and gone east to fight against the blue coat soldier ones. In this time of friendship, the Navajos went often to the fort, okay, to trade and draw rations from their agent. Most of the soldiers made them feel welcome, and the custom grew up to having a horse race between the Navajos and the soldiers. All the Navajos looked forward to these contests, and on racing days, hundreds of men, women, and children would dress in their brightest costumes and ride their finest ponies to the fort. On the crisp, sunny morning of September 19, 1861, several races were run, but the special race of the day was scheduled at noon. It was between Pistol Bullet, a name given to the tribe by the soldiers, on a Navajo pony, and a lieutenant on a quarter horse. Okay? Many bets were made on this race, money, blankets, livestock, beads, whatever one could think of. The horses jumped off together, but a few bit seconds into the race, Pistol Bullet was in trouble. He lost control of his pony, and it ran off the track. Soon, everyone knew that Pistol Bullet's bridle rein had been slashed with a knife. The Navajos went to the judges, who were all soldiers, and demanded that the race be run again. The judges refused. They declared the lieutenant's quarter horse was the winner, and immediately the soldiers formal formed a victory parade for a march into the fort to collect their bets. Infuriated by the trickery, the Navajos stormed after them, but the fort's gates were slammed shut in their faces. When the Navajo attempted to force an entrance, a sentinel shot him dead. What happened next was written down by a white soldier. Uh, the Navajo squaws and children ran in all directions and were shot and bayoneted. 
I succeeded in forming about 20 men. I then marched out to the east side of the post. There I saw a soldier murdering two little children and a woman. I hail, hallowed them immediately to the soldier to stop. He looked up but did not obey my order. I ran as quick as I could but could not get there soon enough to prevent him from killing the two innocent children and wounding severely the squall. I ordered his belts to be taken off and taken prisoner to the post. Meanwhile, the colonel had given the orders to an officer of the day to have the artillery, mountain howitzers, brought out into the open upon the Indians. The sergeant in charge of the mountain uh, howitzers pretended not to understand the order given him, for he considered it an unlawful order. But be being cursed by the officer of the day and threatened he had to execute the order or else himself be in trouble, the Indians scattered in all over the valley below the post, attacked the post herd, wounded the Mexican herder, but did not succeed in getting any stock. Also attacked the expressman, soon, uh, expressman some 10 miles from the post, took his post and mailbag and wounded him in the arm. After the massacre, there were no more Indians to be seen about the post, with the exception of a few squaws, favorites of the officers. The countermanding officer endeavored to make peace again with the Navajos by sending some of those favorite squaws to talk with the chiefs, but the only satisfaction the squaws received was a good flogging. After that day, September 22nd, 1861, it was a long time before there was friendship again between the white men and the Navajos. This book stuck in my mind because it came out within a month of the announcement of the massacres um, like My Lai in, in Vietnam. And it was something that was our, our time, our, our issue. Uh, so that, that was one issue. It also comes to mind time and again when we hear the, the violence. I keep thinking, how can somebody do something like that to another human being? You know, I don't know if it's part of the DNA. Uh, the book was banned because it was seen to be provocative. You know, what a, what a bad statement to make, right? That we should never uh, ignore history. We can draw lessons from history, right? But we can also certainly draw a certain amount of morality from understanding and reading history, uh, stories like this. And then on a lighter note, it's interesting that I got this book because I was then a, an advisor on antitrust matters in Washington. And my career, one of my very first tasks, uh, uh, was to lay out what turned out to be an enforcement action against the Book of the Month Club, because they had something called the negative option. They would send you a book, and you got it, if you were a member of the club. And uh, uh, you didn't have to keep it. You could send it back, but you had to pay the postage. So you could see the unfairness of that. So I drafted up this, this uh, enforcement order, and we ultimately negotiated something to prevent people like me from getting a book that would indelibly remain in their minds, okay? So I don't know who the winners in that process were the decree, but it's a great book, great story, uh, but a tragic story about American history, okay? I was, I was here to be on backup, and it turns out that, um, well, the backup is needed. As, as I uh, was perusing the sort of titles, I really wanted to choose a children's book. The reason that this event is here this year is because when I went to law school at the University of Michigan, it was always a big hit. We had packed rooms like you have today, people's favorite professors, and, and often um, the biggest hit was the children's books. And part of that is because people can't really believe that these classic children's books have been, have been banned. And as I was looking at the list, Two things struck me. One was the number of children's books that had been banned because of things like encouraging insubordination, um, you know, encouraging things like, you know, so we've got, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland, like, you know, fantastical worlds that, you know, people didn't feel like were appropriate. We've got Harriet the Spy that, you know, could encourage the children to spy on their parents and tell lies and things like this. Um, Charlotte's Web was banned for. Um, one of them, it was banned for talking animals. Um, <laughs> certain, you know, like humans are sort of the top of the food chain, and we do not like appreciate the fact that people could be talking about animals as though they were people, and also for the portrayal of a strong female character. That's the same reason um, that underlay the banning or challenging of the, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Dingle, Dingle E. Frankweiler. Um, the Giving Tree was 
challenged for being sexist and possibly criminalizing the uh, forestry uh, industry. Um, Green Eggs and Ham was challenged because, well, there, if, if you read it in a certain way that I'd never thought of, maybe there's like could be some homosexual allegory going on there. I'm just going to take a minute and think about that. It's very interesting. Not anything that I'd seen before, but um, but so there's so the second thing that was I was struck by was how many of these books that we just had in our house. Um, so maybe that tells <laughs> tells you all something about um, either classic children's literature or the things that my children and I like to read. Um, so the 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 selection that I chose today is Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. Um, the reason that it was banned, a boy throwing a tantrum was considered dangerous behavior, and Sendak was accused of glorifying Max's anger, promoting psychologists to condemn it as too dark and frightening. In a March 1969 column for Ladies Home Journal, a child psychologist named Brutal Bettelheim called the book psychologically damaging for three and four-year-olds. He thought the idea that a mother would deprive a child of food was an inappropriate form of punishment and that it would traumatize young readers. And um, for this reason and others, that it was banned heavily in the American South and uh, by libraries nationwide in the first years of its release. It's also been challenged over the years for images that are considered to promote witchcraft and supernatural elements. And um, my children are not old enough for Harry Potter yet, but you can imagine the number of Harry Potter books that would otherwise be up here for that same reason, right? promoting supernatural elements. So I'm going to read Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another, <laughs> his mother called him Wild Thing. And Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night, in Max's room, a forest grew. And grew. And grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max, and he sailed off through night and day. And in and out of weeks, and almost over a year to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. Till Max said, be still, and tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once and they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all, and made him king of all wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. It's <laughs> a lot of rumpus. It's quite a rumpus. They did not have cases to read. <laughs> now stop, Max said, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. Then all around from far away and across the world, he smelled good things to eat, so he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, no, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And Max said, no. The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye and sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day and into the night of his very own room where he found his supper waiting for him and it was still hot. <laughs>